Man, I'm missing Brother Eddie shouting on that side over here. He's been working on Sundays. Boy, I tell you what, I, I'm missing his shout from the side of the room. Hallelujah. He's coming, though. He don't know it. I'm going to pray against his work on Sundays. It's going to dry up. I'm going to pray the Lord give him so much Monday through Friday that he can't, he can't he won't have no energy to work on Sunday. I miss my brother. Hallelujah. Love him. I, I got a word for you today, and um, the Lord laid it on my heart. And, and I've preached on this before, to be honest with you. It, uh, so anytime the Lord puts something back in my spirit, I, I, I start questioning God oftentimes. And, and uh, I say, Lord, why would you bring this back around? I don't think I've ever preached it since we've been here um, uh, that I, I can remember possibly. I, I don't think so. But um, uh, it's something the Lord brought back into my mind. And I said, okay, Lord, if this is what you want, uh, as I begin to seek and begin to seek, um, the Lord sometimes will do things because a, a word is, is meant to be preached. And um, uh, sometimes we need His Word in such a way. God changes things around uh, for, the, for the desperate at heart. We'll be in the book of Judges, the 16th chapter, verse 25 through 28. Hallelujah. Judges 16. Hallelujah. 25 through 28. For those of you that got Bibles, I'll give you a second to turn. Hallelujah. Judges 16, 25 through 28. I'm going to read it. Hallelujah. If you would stand for the reading of the word, give honor to the Lord if you're able. Hallelujah. If you ain't able, then we understand. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Still here a few pages turning. Hallelujah. Get it? You get to jump it in them Old Testament scriptures. Sometimes they're a little more fun to find. Hallelujah. But that's all right. Judges 16. Verse 25, it says, And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that led him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house stands, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful again for your mercy, God, your grace, your anointing. God, I'm thankful for those that are here today to hear your word. I, 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 this is your word, God. It's not mine. This is a message that you've given, Lord. It's not from me, Lord. And, and I can't do anything without you, Lord. I stand empty, Lord, until you fill my vessel, Lord. I, I pray, God, fill my mouth with your words today, God. No, not one of my words to come forth, God, but I pray, Lord, let every word come from you, God, to touch the hearts of your people today, Lord, to set the captive free, God, Lord, to lift up and strengthen us, God, to guide us and to direct us, Lord, God, to put us back on path. Father, I ask you, Jesus, Lord, to uh, help today, God, Lord, every life, let every hear, ear that hears your word, God, let it be applied. God, we give you praise in your precious name, Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a story about Samson. And I know a lot of you guys are familiar with Samson, and maybe some of you maybe not as familiar. Samson was uh, uh, one of our, our, our people from the Old Testament. Uh, he was the strong man. Uh, y'all know who I'm talking about, Samson? He was the man that, that uh, had amazing strength. Uh, the Bible does not say that he was really big. I imagine he probably was not that large at all. I imagine he was probably a, a, a smaller guy. Because if he looked like uh, some kind of, you know, Andre the Giant or something, God wouldn't have got any glory. God wouldn't have got any glory. They would have thought all the strength was in his muscles. The strength was not in his muscles. The strength was in anointing. The strength and the power was in God. Samson was born uh, uh, of a man named Manoah. His mother had, uh, had been barren. And an angel of the Lord told uh, them, uh, you're going to conceive a son and he will be a Nazarite and he will begin to deliver God's people from the Philistines. Uh, it's not long into his story. We find two things about Samson. One is he uh, was obviously very strong. Uh, and one of his other problems is he had a, uh, some issues with the, the women that he was choosing, uh, the lifestyle that he was living, uh, the things that, uh, that got in the way of his purpose. Hallelujah. 
We follow Samson's life a little bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about him, but I'm actually going another direction. I, I just got you to make sure everyone understands. I, I can't assume ever that when I'm speaking to a group of people that everyone knows the same story the way I do it. You know, I've heard it for uh, many times, and some of you, this may be the first time you hear some of these details. So if you've heard this a few times, bear with me just for a moment. Um, we find that not only is he extraordinarily strong um, um, uh, when the Lord would anoint him, but uh, also that God had chose him to deliver his people uh, from the Philistines. Uh, we know that God's people is in bondage under the Philistine people, and, and they had been causing much havoc and, and troubles and distress through God's people, and the Lord sent him. He was born with a purpose. Huh? You look at your neighbor and say, you're born with a purpose. Uh, you're born with a purpose. You are not born to, uh, to be in the nothingness. You are not born to, uh, just to uh, be a, a knot on a log. You are not born to, to do nothing, but God had a purpose in you. And sometimes along our journey, circumstances and situations and lifestyle choices and the things that we do, sometimes it gets us a little off path of where we are, are intended to go. But here we find Samson, he is, he is chosen, he is special. The angel of the Lord had told his parents all these things about him. So you know, I can imagine as Samson was growing up, he was probably a little bit spoiled. Now, you know, I don't know about any of y'all. I look around here at some of my nephews. I see my grandson there. And, I, you know, as parents and grandparents, we love our children. And you know what? We love them so much, sometimes we spoil them. But imagine, moms and dads, if you had an angel of God come out and said, you're going to have a child, and this child is going to change the world, spoke to you audibly, and told you about how special this child is, and this Nazarite vow, all the things that you had to do, because of the Nazarite vow, there was many restrictions, not only for the child, but for the mom. All of these things, can you imagine... When that child was born, you're like, oh, this is the one. Oh, they're like, they got little Sammy, Sammy, little Sammy Poo. Somebody said, can I hold Sammy? Oh, no, this is the chosen one. But I just want to know. Spoiled. You know how I know he was spoiled? Because in his adulthood, he was just as spoiled. In his adult life, he was, he was just as spoiled. He was anointed, and he was just as rotten as the most spoiled kids around. Now I'm very fortunate. I got a grandson that his mama thinks he's spoiled, but I think he's I think he does pretty good. I got some nephews that mom and dad might think they were spoiled, but ain't none of them nowhere like Samson was. Because Samson, he made some really bad choices. He made some choices of doing some things on his own that cost him so much. We find as Samson, as he began to follow his own desires, he had a purpose and a gift of God. A gift from birth from God to see his people delivered, to see the bondage of others removed, to, to, to see freedom to take place. God had put a, a God-appointed gift in him. And instead of choosing to use his gift for its purpose, he chose to use his gift for his own pleasures. And sometimes along the way, kind of fulfilled some of God's purpose. So, some along the way, kind of got things right. Almost by accident. Samson, we find, is he, uh, his, his dad, they, they, my parents wanted him to have a wife. Uh, they had a, a women that he was supposed to choose. He said, no, I don't want any of these. I want one of those Philistine women. Now, didn't we just read he was supposed to deliver... God's people from the Philistines. I'm going somewhere. Y'all looking at me like a deer in the headlights. I'm going somewhere. Uh, he was supposed to be, uh, he was, I could imagine probably in his raising, his parents kept saying one of these days, uh, these Philistines, they got us in such bondage, you're going to be the deliverer. I would think and somehow in his mind, he would look at them as the enemy, but he said, mm, boy, I tell you what, I don't want any of these women that, that I'm supposed to have. I want one of those. Over and over. Uh, even he found, he found his happiness in harlots and, and all these different places. 
Over and over we find as Samson we begin to uh, fall into these traps and things, we would find that he would shake himself and, and his strength would come upon him. We find in one situation that, uh, that he found himself as they brought him into a, a city, the enemy, the Philistines couldn't understand his great power. They thought they had him all locked in. They closed the gate. The Bible said that he went up and took the gate, took the whole gate, the hinges, the posts, the pillars, and just walked out with the whole thing. Amazing strength. They couldn't understand it. Couldn't figure it out. We find over and over, the Bible says that he ruled and reigned for 20 years. We find a, another situation that he got so upset with them from uh, some things they'd done, he took and caught some foxes and tied their tails together and put what they called a firebrand between their tails and, and released the foxes into the crops of the Philistines and watched all of their crops and all the hard work of not only those that was uh, causing him problems, but all of the people watched all their crops burnt. Another situation, the Bible said he took the, the, the jawbone of a donkey and killed thousands of Philistines as they were strapped in armor and swords and all of these things to, with nothing more than just a jawbone that he found laying from a mule. And he took and used it as a weapon and killed thousands until the, the Bible says that it was in heaps. Hallelujah. We begin to read in the beginning of this story as we're, we're talking about all these things that Samson did. I started off reading the end of the story to you. Because the end of the story is Samson finally found himself in love with a woman named Delilah. Oh, and he would go down and lay his head in her lap and she would love on him and pat on him. But what he didn't know that the Philistine people had already said they'll, they'll pay her. If you could just help us to figure out the secret of his strength. Why were they so interested in where his strength come from? Obviously, it wasn't because they, they wasn't thinking it was big muscles. This was too much strength, too much power for any one man to have. It's got to be coming from somewhere. Samson had a secret. He knew his Nazarite vow, and he knew that one of the things that he uh, had several things he wasn't supposed to do, and he pushed the limits and pushed the limits, but he held to that one thing. His Nazarite vow said that he couldn't cut his hair. He finally, as Delilah pressed him and pressed him, he lied to her a time or two, and she got all upset with him, and, oh, you don't love me. You don't love me. You know what he had been doing? He had been killing Philistines by the groves. Not because he was in an army. Not because he was trying to lead God's people, but because he would get angry and have temper tantrums. At will and at random. So the Philistine people finally get someone that he is so close to, and he reveals his secret to her. And she, while his head's in her lap, he reach, she reaches and cuts off that hair. And the Philistine, she calls him in. And the Bible said that Samson jumped up as at times before and he shook himself and did not know that the anointing had left him. And he no longer had that strength and power. And here's where we pick up at this point in the story where we started in our scripture. We find that the Philistine people said they, were, they had him and they were making sport with him. But before we get into discussing this sport, I, I want to ask you a question. I want to give you another perspective. I, I, I want to change this around because very obviously we've been talking the whole time about Samson. As you read through this story, everything is about his life and the decisions from his birth and all of his wrong decisions and all the things that he had done. The calling that was in his life and, and all the, the murdering that he had done. What about the Philistine people? Now, I know the Philistine people uh, were, were not God's chosen. I know that they had God's people in bondage. I, I know that they did a lot of wrong things, but don't you know that a lot of those soldiers killed in his rage was somebody's daddy and somebody's son and somebody's brother? A lot of the crops that was burned may not have belonged to the kings and those. There were people that were, were working hard in the fields day after day and they watched their labor burn in his anger because he was mad. Can't you imagine how they hated him? And they couldn't do anything about it. He had so much power that no matter how much they wanted deliverance and how much they wanted change from him, at his random whims, he could destroy their lives. At his random choices, he could cause destruction. 
So I ask you, when they cut his hair off, and he shook himself, and he realized that the power was not there, and they were able to grab a hold to him and take him and subdue him, why did they not kill him? Why did they not kill Samson at this very moment? Why did they not? Why did they choose to put him in the prison house and, and tie him up? Why did they not choose to uh, put a sword through his heart and get rid of this enemy once and for all? Why did they not? Why, why did they not choose this? Surely somebody come up when the when the captain said, "No, we're going to take him and put him grinding at the mill." Surely to God, somebody come up and said, "Listen, that's that's that Philistine that." Killed my family. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's, that, uh, that's that man that killed my family, not Philistine. But that's Samson. That's the one that caused so much havoc in my life. That's the one that's destroyed my whole family. That's the one that burned everything that I, every financial gain I ever had, burned up my whole life. Everything that I owned was destroyed by this one. Don't you think it best to kill him? Nah. We're going to make him work. We're going to put him grinding meal. We've lost this. We're gonna we, we we got it. You know what they said? I can handle it. I can handle it. Put that up there for me. I can handle it. Somebody thought, I know he's been dangerous all of these years. 20 years the Bible said that he had, had run. 20 years he had been killing at will. 20 years he had caused destruction. They could not stop it. But I can handle it. We got him now. I don't know how long it was that he was grinding at the mill before they decided to start taking him in and making sport in front of the arena. I don't know how many days had went by, but maybe they started off trimming his hair in the beginning or maybe they started keeping it shaved. I don't know how long it was. But I can tell you this. I know why they brought him into the arena. Because they lost fear of him. Because for 20 years they were afraid. 20 years they were in torment. 20 years they saw, is there anybody? Can somebody, I'll do anything. I'll pay whatever amount it takes to get free. Anybody know? They said, I'll pay. They, they told uh, the woman, they said, I'll pay any price. If you can find out how I can destroy this enemy, where his strength lies, I'll pray. Why would they not kill him when he was down? It's the same reason when we get deliverance from things in our lives and we don't completely cut it out of our lives completely. Some of us have fought some things in our past, some things that have called complete destruction, has burned our financial gain, has burned everything in our life, has burned a path and eat a hole. It's killed your sisters, it's killed your brothers, it's killed your friends. You've watched destruction run through rampant life after life being affected, life after life, financial gain ruined, everything burned up at his will, at his leisure, at his pleasure, whenever he thinks he would just cause some hell and havoc in your life. The enemy of your soul has been burning things. And if we are not careful, we will lose fear of that which one time destroyed us. I can handle it. I believe I can almost hear it coming out of the, the general's mouth or the captain of the, the, of, the Syrian, of, the, of the Philistines. I'm a big man. I can do it. I want everybody to see. And he went from grinding at the mill and, and a little time had passed and a little time had passed and, and they had Samson going around uh, holding straps to the poles, grinding the mill round and round and round. And the longer the delay was in his strength, the more they began to not fear him. The longer they thought they had him under control, he began to grind round and round in the wheel and they began to lose fear day by day by day. And it wasn't long we find the Bible says that a child, a lad, led him by the hand into the arena. They plucked his eyes out. Samson was blind. But they didn't kill him. You know what they did? They just wounded him. What is it in your life that you just wounded instead of killed? What is it in your life that you've only wounded a little bit? 
Made you feel better because you, you got one up on the situation and the circumstance. What is it that you wounded somewhat? Makes you forget about all the hell. Makes you forget about the days gone by. Makes you forget about all the destruction. How bad it was. The tears. The burning. The phone calls. People all around you dying. What is it? We just allowed that silence. We wounded him a little bit. And we've not made a choice to put a sword through his heart. I can tell you this. The Bible said that that little lad took him by the hand and began to lead him into there. At what point do we allow the things that have caused hell and destruction to be casual in our homes? At what point do we allow our children to begin to be a participate and to be a part of our, our of the things that have caused such hell and destruction? Huh? It's the things that we lose fear of. I know. I can tell you, most of you guys know me. You know my testimony. I, I was selling dope next door. Christian can tell you about the path. I was the one that allowed my little one to be right in the middle of all the nonsense. I was the one that allowed Satan to come along and take her by the hand and lead her down the wrong path. I was the one. I can preach this to me because I lived it. She lived it. She went through hell because of my choices. Because I was not afraid of that which was destroying lives all around me. little lad took him in and Samson said, would you put my hands on the pillars? He's blind that I might lean upon them. And you know what he did? He leaned into these pillars. And the Bible said that he began to lean upon them and he began to pray. He said his hair had begun to grow back. The anointing had begun to come back upon him. Little by little, power began to be restored back to Samson. Now, I know I'm flipping this story around a little bit backwards. I know this is supposed to be the story of Samson regaining and having victory. But can I tell you this? Even in Samson's death, his arrogance took him. Because he didn't say, Lord, avenge your people. He said, avenge me of mine adversaries and let me have strength one more time. He began to put his hands around a pillar on this side and around a pillar on that side. And you know what? The, uh, if you could look at the, the representation of these pillars, I believe one represented pride and arrogance. And the other one represented ignorance. Because in our pride and in our ignorance, we make some of the greatest mistakes of our life. And the lives, he said, the Bible said that he began to pull upon these pillars. He began to pull upon the ignorance and, and began to pull up, up, upon the arrogance of, of, of the Philistine people because they thought they could handle it, because they thought they were strong enough, because they thought because they wounded him a little bit, I've got this all together. They lost fear of that which caused destruction. And in that pride and in that arrogance, the Bible said that he destroyed more Philistines in his death than he ever did in his life. Even Samson in his death didn't say, Lord, do it for you. He wanted it for himself. Can I tell you, it's not enough to pray for your peace and your deliverance and all these things just for you. But Lord, use me as an instrument, God, to help your people. Uh, you want to put a sword in the heart of the enemy? You want to crucify that devil? Get past yourself a little bit and say, Lord, I don't just need deliverance for me, Lord. But your people, my loved ones, my family, my friends, God, Lord, use me as an instrument today, God. Lord, if I be willing to be a sacrifice, it's not about me, God. Lord, but help me, God. Remind me, God, of how bad it was. God, remind me, Lord, of how bad I needed you, Jesus. Remind me, Lord, how much, how important that you are for me. Remind me, God, today, Lord, that I need you every day more and more. God, don't let me get slack, God. Lord, don't let me forget how bad it used to be. Don't let me forget the times that I prayed for help, God, and it seemed like no help was around. Lord, don't let me forget how the destruction was coming in my life. How my fields were on fire. Lord, how we were destitute. How we were hopeless. Oh God, never let me forget. 
ever let me be so arrogant to think I can handle it? Because I can't, God. I can't handle it. We sing the song, I can't go back. I won't go back. Why? Because I can't handle it. I can't handle it. Can I tell you today, I know this is quiet. I know this is a, this is a, a hard word. But I want to tell you today, Lord didn't give you freedom for yourself. Not just for you. You were born with a purpose. And when you found salvation and you were born again, you were born fresh with a fresh purpose. And your purpose has got to be about not being selfish and not about me. But God, what can I do? God, let me not worry so much about everything that I have on my agenda. But what about you? God, let me, let me not be so concerned and consumed by the things that please me, Lord. Though I may be anointed, though I may be called, Lord, don't let me be so worried about what pleases me, God, that I miss my purpose like Samson did. Let me be so, not so arrogant that I can fall into the trap and into the snare of what I want and what's so good and important and feels good to me. Lord, don't let me fall into that snare. Hallelujah. I want to tell you today, church, Oh, how beautiful and how amazing and how, how phenomenal our God is to love us when we're unlovable, to see us as, 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 as the broken pieces that we've been and have the grace to see us restored. Oh, let's don't, let's don't let arrogance uh, cause a collapse in our life. Let's realize that, that God wants us to destroy that enemy in our life. Whatever it is, we all got different things. Huh? Some of you have never tasted alcohol. Some of you, you don't know what it's like to get high. Some of you don't know what it's like to, uh, to wake up and be peeking out around the tenfold in the windows. You may have never had those experiences. You might not know what it's like to ride in the back of a squad car all cramped up and no room and, and that smell that's back there. You may not have ever experienced these things, but I assure you, you still have some things that you have to kill in your life. Just like the rest of us have some things. And we have to make sure it's good and dead that we never lose fear of it. Because I promise you this, that devil's always coming back. And when you think he's the weakest, he'll start finding some strength. They thought Samson was all done because he was blinded and he was humiliated. But he found strength one more time. I don't want to see destruction in another life. Can I be honest as pastor here? I look around today. We've had a lot of folks that's been excited they ain't here today. We've had a lot of folks so excited they couldn't wait to get here on Sundays. But there's some folks that forgot how bad it was. How the enemy burned their, their fields and how the enemy crept in and stole from their children, stole from their lives. Because they thought they could handle it. So you can't mix the old and the new together. The Bible even goes about, there was, they used to use what they called wine skins when they made wine. And if you know anything about a wine, there's a fermenting process. And they used these leather bags. And in these leather bags was a, um, uh, 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 they would put the, the, the great stuff in there and they would put the stuff and they would begin to let them ferment. And the leather, they would, with it being wet, would swell and stretch way out, have it sealed and they would know that when it relaxed and come all the way back down and relaxed and went back to normal, that the wine had fermented and then it was ready. But the Bible says you don't put new wine in old skins because it will cause destruction. It says if you put the new wine in an old skin that's already been stretched, it's been weakened already. And when you put the new wine and it begins to ferment it, when it stretches, instead of having elasticity, it will burst. And it says you not only lose the, this wine skin, but you lose the wine. Can I tell you today that you can't put the new life in the old bottle? 
You can't put the new anointing God has given you back where you come from. You can't mix the new and the old together without having destruction. There's a The Bible talks about a new wine, a Holy Ghost anointing. Brother Chase will get to speak about that power, the anointing, that, that blowing through. You can't put that new wine in an old skin. Oh, I can handle it. I can handle it. Jesus said it'll burst. And you not only lose the skin, but you lose what was inside. The Philistine people thought they could handle it. And there was destruction. I come, I feel like the Lord gave me this today for a warning. Stop trying to put this new gift in an old bottle. Realize that which caused destruction from you before will destroy you again. You got to kill that thing. You got to kill your past. You got to kill off some of those relationships. You got to kill off some of those things in your life, huh? That brought you back to where you used to be. Oh, they'll come. They'll come. Huh? You got to get to the point to where uh, it's, it's, I want to come hang out. Praise God. Come to church. I'm watching it. Say, so you don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. I'm watching it. I'm involved in lives. I'm watching it. And I'm angry. I'm mad at the devil. My heart is breaking for lives. Nobody has any idea how many phone calls we make, how many texts we send out, how many times when people we start seeing things go around, how many tears is cried, how much time we spend praying because the Bible says he puts a pastor to be a watchman on a wall and he's watching. And I'm, and I'm angry at the devil because he's causing hell and havoc in people's lives that I love. And I come to tell you today, God loves you. Your pastor loves you. And God has called you to kill off those things which one time destroyed you. It's not enough to just wound that enemy. Let the fire get on the inside. Uh, let it burn on the inside. Uh, let that light begin to shine. Uh, let your worship sing out unto God. Let it, let it in your home manifest a, 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 a manifestation of praise and of worship. It's not enough just to come in on a Sunday and get what you need, get your fix on for a little while. You will make me happy to see you show up. I promise you that. I promise you. We had that one Sunday, we only had one or two people showed up. I thought I, I liked I went home, to be honest. I think I shed a tear or two. I know anyway, everybody had different situations. So you will make me happy by showing up. But you won't keep your enemies dead by just showing up. You won't keep your enemy at bay by just showing up. It's through the week. It's through the it's through every day. You gotta kill that rascal. Hallelujah. Come on, stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.